For millennia now, the biblical king Solomon has been thought to have had magical control over both angels and demons. From the use of magical seals, magical rings, even super-powered magical worms, Solomon is said to have used even such forces to construct the holy temple in Jerusalem. In fact, I've covered the history of Solomon as a magician in my episode on the infamous grimoire, The Lesser Key of Solomon. If you want to dive into those legends, check out the card above. However, in this episode, I want to focus on an even more obscure object of Solomonic magic, a portable altar for the summoning, not of demons, but of angels. This magical altar, or Almandel, is actually described in the Lesser Key of Solomon, though the Goetia usually gets all the showtime and is well attested in medieval magic very likely having its origins well before Solomonic magic even reached Europe. In this episode, I want to discuss the intersection of Solomonic angelic magic and the inheritance of astral magic and theurgy as taken up into the lesser known but really fascinating angel summoning altar, the Almondel. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics and esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics and esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting me on Patreon or with a one-time donation. You can find those links below and I really do appreciate your consideration of supporting the project of Esoterica. But now let's turn to a magical altar inscribed with divine names and symbolism meant to summon hosts of angels. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and welcome to Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Solomonic magic is a widely attested school of ritual conjuration typically concerned with the summoning and binding of supernatural beings, often with a wide range of ceremonial furniture, invocations, and the use of divine names set into magical geometric shapes, typically circles and triangles, meant to protect the conjurer and trap the creature summoned, respectively. The most famous or infamous version of this magic is the genre of literature usually referred to as clavicula solomonis or the key of Solomon literature, very well attested early on in the scholastic period and continuing in popular practice and repression into the contemporary world of the occult. Of course, the most famous instance, at least in the Anglophone world, is the Lesser Key of Solomon, made famous in its employ by early 20th century occultists, folks like Aleister Crowley, but also because of the lurid demonic descriptions, the weird seals associated with these demons, and even its appearance in pop culture. Looking at you, Paimon, I'm still looking to get in touch with your agent. Of course, the exact origins of these texts is pretty mysterious, but there is substantial evidence of their very early entrance into Europe via Islamic and Jewish magical schools, but also via a 15th century Greek introduction into Italy, all of which likely reaches back to Greco-Egyptian magic of the late classical world, although the exact dots are hard to connect. Despite the popularity of the Clavicula Solomonis literature, other forms of magic attributed or associated with King Solomon are also known from the Middle Ages, and that's where the Almondel fits in as much as it does. 
The Almandel, or Almandel, it, the spelling is widely defective. As you can hear, the word almost certainly comes directly from Arabic for the word for magic circle, though the origins of the term could be as distant as India. It's basically a small wax altar inscribed upon with various magical symbols and divine names, supported by four candlesticks, which is used to invoke various angels. The altar itself is described in about a dozen different manuscripts in Hebrew, Latin, and German, respectively, with the earliest dating to the mid-15th century of the Common Era, though the magic described in those texts is significantly earlier. In fact, the text, or at least the name Almandal, is attested as early as William of Paris and Albertus Magnus, the teacher of, well, Thomas Aquinas, and it continues to be known by occult luminaries such as Pico, Trithemius, Agrippa, and his student Johann Weyer, although it's worth pointing out that they keep the practice of the Almandel at arm's length as well. The manuscripts themselves differ considerably as to the composition, construction, and the use of the Almandel. The origins of the text may date back even as far to late classical theurgy, whereby divine beings were invoked and communed with as part of the spiritual exercises of late Neoplatonism. However, as you might imagine, Christianity and Islam as a supplanted paganism, these divine beings were increasingly transformed into both astral intelligences on the more philosophical side of things and angelic and demonic beings on the more religious side of things. Thus, the pagan theurgy of someone like Iamblichus is slowly transformed into the astral and angelical magical systems which were already developing along separate evolutionary paths. It seems that the earliest strata of the Almendal had the altar made of metal, thus likely linking it to the talismanic astral magic of the Islamic world, which was surrounded by four inscribed candles which were purified, all of this was purified, through exorcistic incantations and suffumigation, subjecting it to sacred smoke, after which spirits could be, well, summoned and controlled, is usually the point of Solomonic magic. This metal version eventually gives way to an inscribed square wax altar, despite the name of the text literally meaning the circle, supported by various candlesticks. The inscriptions on the altar vary, but most often contain a pretty regular stock of divine names, usually Hebrew in various degrees of corruption, and classical occult symbols, especially pentacles. Oddly enough, the Hebrew version of the Greek word tetragrammaton, spelled out in Hebrew letters, tetragrammaton, rather than having the four-letter Hebrew name for God, yod He vov He, for whatever reason in the Hebrew version. It's a bit of a strange anomaly. Further, the altar has holes drilled in it by which incense, specifically mastic, could waft through as part of the angelic invocation. However, the more substantial manner in which these texts differ from one another is the varying degree to which astrology plays a central role in both the construction of the Amandel, but more importantly, the angelic hierarchy it's meant to summon. For instance, in the more famous English version, there's only a relatively small astrological adjunct with the angels invoked limited to the four cardinal directions, or cora, or altitudes, as the text refers to it. Of course, the color of the altar and the candles varies with the target cora, or altitude, but otherwise the text isn't deeply astrological in character. This can be really contrasted with other, especially continental manuscripts, that have a full range of angelic or astral beings linked to a complex understanding of the zodiac with the number and range of the spirits greatly expanded, from four groups of angels to twelve in those texts. Another significant difference in the textual traditions, especially in the insular versus the continental traditions, is the presence of a crystal stone in the English manuscript tradition. In the continental texts, it appears that the angels appear above the Almandel, or perhaps in the mastic smoke, whereas in the insular text, it seems that the use of a crystal scrying stone is used in which the angels perhaps appear within the stone. Of course, this links the Almandel to John Dee's famous angelic or Enochian sessions, but more on that in a moment. 
Overall, the text contains the instruction for the construction of the altar, the various spirits it can summon, which again range greatly from tradition to tradition, and the invocation for their summoning, some texts of which actually include the Apostles' Creed, showing just the degree to which the compositor of this tradition is trying to Christianize this form of magic. The details vary from text to text. For instance, some manuscripts indicate that by dressing in matching colors as the wax of the almondel, this can ensure the appearance of the spirits. And if they're just not being punctual, you know, you call them and they're not picking up, you can inscribe their names or symbols on the wax of the candles, thus forcing them to appear before the flames erase their signs. There's just something about threatening a tardy angel with burning that I find wonderfully cheeky. The point of summoning the angels also involves more straightforward magical desires or general interrogation of angels. You just want to ask them some questions to actually forming bonds of friendship with these angelic beings, thus elevating one's soul towards the divine. In the more zodiacal versions, the various altitudes of the angels indeed reach ever upwards toward the divine as well, perhaps again concealing the Neoplatonic idea of a theurgy which elevates one's soul, still encoded as astral magic. Of course, that the text deals with angels and not demons didn't exactly earn it high praise from its detractors. William of Paris argued that people who think that simple geometric angles have the power to bind spirits are basically idiotic and perhaps even idolaters, and Albertus Magnus held that the astrological element of the text was simply a cover for what it actually was. It was just astral necromancy. It summoned demons no matter what they called themselves or what the Magus thought they were. Of course, Agrippa in his later three books of occult philosophy would hold that certain angles did in fact have mystical power, and he mentions the Almondel specifically and the pentacle in this respect. If you're interested in the occult power of mathematics and geometry in Agrippa's thinking, make sure to check out my episode on that topic in the card above. Of course, without a doubt, the most famous uptake of the practice of the Almondel would be the scrying sessions of Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly. As you probably know, the earliest of the so-called Enochian sessions were concerned with the angels revealing a range of ritual furniture, including a series of wax seals, which were inscribed upon with a incredibly complex divine name. Here, two different strains of magical practice come together. Both the Almondel and the Sworn Book of Honorius come together as part of a complex substratum of Enochian magic more generally, which is of course still practiced to this day. In fact, in an English manuscript of both the Sworn Book and the Almondel, there is a shared list of angels of the zodiac or the princes of the Twelve Altitudes. Of course, D, via his medium Kelly, would also use a crystal stone atop his wax seal of God, just as described in the insular Almondel texts. In fact, the language of the first Enochian key seems to actually echo the language of the invocation found in the Almondel literature, thus making the Almondel a direct influence on one of the most profoundly enduring and mysterious schools of Western magic. This small text of ritual magic, only covering about 10 manuscript folios, typically philosophically reaches back to the late classical world. It employs the magical theories of the Islamic period and went on to endure through the scholastic Middle Ages and would eventually influence John Dee's Enochian sessions and has actually experienced renewed interest among contemporary occult practitioners with ritual Almondel altars available for purchase online. While not as famous as the Goetia or the Abramelin ritual, the Almondel represents a fascinating form of magical practice, well though variably attested in the Solomonic magical tradition. The best critical edition is by Vernizé. This is primarily of the Latin manuscript family, which seems to be the oldest extant, and this edition is in French. Gare also has a really important paper on the Amandel, though you'll have to read it in Italian. 
The best introduction to the text in English is Brimmer and Vinstra's The Metamorphosis of Magic from Late Antiquity to the Early Modern Period, which also includes an English version of the Almondel as well. Another version, of course, can be found in the Peterson edition of the Lesser Key of Solomon and on his magnificent website, the Esoteric Grotto, which contains further images as well. I'll also include some links to the manuscripts of the Almondel in the description below. Again, this is a brief but fascinating aspect of the history, influence, and contemporary practice of Solomonic demonic, but also angelic conjuration. Make sure to subscribe, check out my other content on topics and esotericism, and again, if you like this kind of stuff, consider supporting my work by looking up my Patreon or considering a one-time donation. You can find those links below. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.